Good morning. Good morning and welcome to church this morning as we come to worship God. It is great to be back, having been away for the last two weeks, and except for uh, one of Peter Hutchison's dodgy jokes about my hairline, <laughs> uh, I know it went so well over the last two weeks, and we're very grateful to the two Peters who led and brought God's word. Uh, if you're visiting this morning, you are so, so welcome. My name is Mark, if we haven't met, and I'm the minister here, and uh, we're delighted that you're here and look forward to joining with you as we worship God. And if this is your home, if this is where you regularly come, you're just as welcome. And so it is great to come in out of the monsoon and be able to come and meet together and worship this morning. We come to worship God and that is no light thing. And as we do this morning, God calls us, he speaks to us and he calls us to be a holy people and to come and to meet with him. So here are these famous words, these well-known words from Exodus 19, as we respond to his call. It says this, Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. This morning, God calls us, along with millions of people all over the world, of every tribe and tongue, and he calls us to be his people, to be set apart, to be different, and to come and meet around and meet upon his word. So let's respond to his call this morning by standing and singing. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Let's sing. forever 
Well, as we continue to respond to God's call this morning, let me lead us in prayer. Let's pray. Lord God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we come before you, the true and living God, and we give thanks to you. We thank you and we praise you for who you are. We thank you, Lord, as we have just sung, that you are forever faithful and you're forever good. We thank you, Lord, in the midst of a broken world, there is a hope of a faithful and a good God. Lord, as we come before you, we recognize our sin, that it's in the midst of a broken world that we come because of sin, and that sin has penetrated all of our hearts. And so this morning, as we gather as your people, Lord, we do so to say sorry for our sin. But we thank you, Lord, that as we sing and we respond to your word, we do so because of your grace, your amazing grace, that by the love of God the Father, who sent your only Son, and that by the grace of Christ, who lived and who died and who rose and who has ascended and who reigns forever from heaven today, and by the power of the Spirit who comes to people like us and through the Word of God leads us to you, convicts us, changes us and renews us. We praise you, God, that we can truly sing that forever you're faithful and forever you're good. God, as we meet this morning, we pray that you would receive all the praise and all the glory. And we pray, Lord, that as we do, would you speak to us through your Word would you lead us and guide us that we might be a people who love your word, who stand upon it and embrace it? Because as we do, and as we are led to Christ, and as we live in Christ, there really is true life and true blessing forever. God, as we come this morning, help us to be a holy people, responding as you have called us to do so, so that through us, your goodness, your love, your faithfulness, your holiness might be declared before the world. Lead us this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, having just prayed the gospel story in many ways, we're going to stand and sing the gospel story again. So let's stand and sing, Turn Your Eyes to Jesus. And at the end of that song, if we remain standing, we will do so for our offering as we stand as an act of worship, bringing what God has given us and giving it back to him. So let's stand, let's sing, Turn Your Eyes to Jesus.
Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you so much for all good things that come from you. And we pray, Lord, that as we give back to you this morning, we thank you for the generosity of your people. And we thank you that we can be generous because of your generosity to us. And we pray, Lord God, that every penny and resource would be used for your glory to make disciples of all nations beginning here in Waringstown. So please lead us. And guide us, we pray, for the praise and glory of your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, at this point in our service, we now come to our children's talk. And I know that you've been looking at different commandments over the last number of weeks. But today I want to speak to you about something very special. And I want to talk to you about this the Lord's Supper. Anybody heard the Lord's Supper before? Put your hand up if you've heard the phrase, the Lord's Supper. Or you might have heard of communion. Anybody heard of the Lord's Supper or communion? A few. Okay, well, next Sunday, we are going to be having the Lord's Supper. We're going to be participating. We're going to be taking of the Lord's Supper. There's going to be communion here next Sunday. And I want to talk to you about what it is that we do when we take of the Lord's Supper. What is the Lord's Supper? What is this all about? Now tell me this, does anybody like this? Ooh, does my clicker work? Anybody like a gray screen? (laughs) Oh, anybody like this? Lasagna, that hand went up very quickly. Lasagna, okay. What about this one? few more hands. Love a good hamburger. What about this one? More for pizza? Pizza's more popular than a hamburger? Wow. What about this one? Some people pretending. <laughs> pretending to like the healthy stuff. Okay, this is, these are all different kinds of food. Now, why do we eat food? <clears throat> We eat food, yes, because we like it, but we eat food because we need it. We need food. Food gives us energy. It keeps us healthy. It keeps us going. It helps us to do whatever it is we want to do. And without food, we could not keep going. Well, when it comes to the Lord's Supper, this is a meal. It's food and it's a drink. And on the screen, you can see bread, which is the food, and you can see that cup, and in that cup, there is wine. It's a drink. And this is a meal. But it's not just a physical meal. It doesn't just help our bodies. This is a meal for our souls. Did you know that we have souls? Yeah. We have a body, and we have a soul inside our body. And when we die, it's our soul that goes to be with God when we're Christians. And when we take this meal, we are eating it so that God might strengthen us. He might feed us. He might nourish us. He might make us strong and give us the energy to keep living as Christians. And the way that happens is because as we take the bread and the wine and we think about Jesus' death, God strengthens us. Now, how does he do that? Well, do you see the bread on the screen? That bread points to something. It points to Jesus' body. And the red wine, the red points to his blood. And on the cross, when Jesus died, he was broken, you could say. That means he received what we deserve for our sin. And he bled And through his broken body and the blood that he shed for us, he he can forgive us and change us as we come to him. And so when we take the bread and wine and we think about what they point us to and we believe in them and we trust in Jesus, God feeds us. He strengthens us and gives us the energy to keep us going on. So next week, we're going to be meeting together to have the Lord's Supper after the sermon. 
And that is what's happening. We are having a spiritual meal. So I want you to go home today, and I want you to tell your mom and dad or your grannies or grandas or whoever you're living with or staying with this afternoon, and I want you to tell them what the Lord's Supper is all about so that as they can get ready to come together next week for us to take of this meal. Okay, let me pray, and then we'll sing. Lord God, thank you so much for your goodness to us and your grace. Thank you for the Lord's Supper. Thank you that you build us up, you strengthen us in the faith as we eat and as we drink by faith. We pray, Lord, that we would think about that and that we would look to you and trust in you and keep being strengthened by you. Help us to do that generally and help us to get ready as we come together next week to take of this meal. Bless the children, Lord, we pray, and the adults and those who look after them. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, let's stand and let's sing about Jesus and let's sing about how he is strong and how he is kind towards us. So let's sing. can feel free to head on out now.
Well, if you have a Bible, please turn with me to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. And as we're turning, just a couple of things to highlight to you. If uh, you don't get the weekly email sent out by the church office, please do let us know, because really all the details of everything that goes on throughout the week in the life of the church is in that email. So please do be checking that, please do be reading that, but if you're not on the list, let us know and we'll send that email out to you so that you know everything that goes on. But just to highlight a few things, and one is uh, to remember that communion is next Sunday. So let's do be thinking about that and be preparing for that as we come to meet as a church family. Uh, Also on Thursday evening is our next study in the men's group. Uh, That meets at 8 o'clock on Thursday night over at the Hub. And we're going to look at the question of what is man? Man is the Bible word. Uh, What is a person according to the Bible? And that is a very topical question at the minute. There's a lot of discussion over what a human being is. What is a person? But we want to look at what the Bible says. What does God say that a person is? What is man? So if you're uh, male and you'd like to be part of that group, come along on Thursday night, 8 o'clock in the hub, and we'll look at that from Genesis. Uh, Also to say that the PCI have sent out um, a request for people who are interested in serving in the General Assembly councils and committees. So if you're someone and you think that you could help out in that way, please let me or one of the elders know. Uh, This is an opportunity to help shape the denomination. PCI has lots of committees and lots of councils, and we can get onto those and help serve the church more generally. Uh, So if you're interested in that, please do let me know and uh, I can point you, or one of the elders can point you in the right direction to help with that. And then finally, the Church of Ireland, over just across the road, is holding an evangelistic outreach event. Um, It's actually a week long, and that is in February. And they have asked us to highlight that on Saturday the 24th of February at half seven is an event with the New Irish Arts So you might be familiar with the New Irish Choir, the New Irish Orchestra. They're holding an event in the Church of Ireland the 24th of February at half seven. And if you're interested in going, tickets are 15 pounds. And there is a special rate for the people involved in PCI, uh, in WPC, of 15 (laughs) pounds. So if you'd like to go, do check it out on their website, uh, but get your ticket early. Uh, And that's for the 24th of February. Okay, Genesis chapter 3. I'm going to read from verses 1 to 7, and then we'll look at it a little more closely. This is the holy and infallible and inerrant word of God. It says this. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. Let's pray, and we'll look at that more closely. Lord God, as we turn to your holy word this morning, we pray that you would open our eyes, 
you would open our ears and you would open our hearts to see and hear and receive the truth of what you say and to lead us to Jesus. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. A number of years ago, I came across an image that has really stayed with me. I can't remember where I saw it or when it actually happened, but I do remember the context. It was at a Christian event, and somebody was teaching from the Bible. And as they taught, they showed a picture of a man and a woman in a garden with a tree and an apple and a snake. And that, they said, is what the story of Adam in the Bible is all about. I wonder this morning, if you can remember back to when you first started learning Bible stories. Maybe you learned as a child. And if you can think back to the time when you first came across the story of Adam, I wonder, did you come across an image a bit like that? A man and a woman in a garden with a tree and an apple and a snake. But I wonder this morning, if you were to take that image and break it all down, what would you say that image is about? What is the story of Adam or Adam and Eve in the Bible? What is that story really all about? Well, this morning we're starting a brand new series looking at the question, what is the gospel? If you think back to September to December, we looked in the book of Philippians at partnering together in the gospel. But now we're going to ask, well, what is the gospel? What is it that we're partnering in? And as we do so, we're going to look at different characters and stories throughout the Old Testament. And as we focus in on this one, the story of Adam, the first man that ever lived, and we find out what is this story really all about, this story is going to give us an insight into the gospel so that we might see something of what the gospel is about as the gospel continues to speak to you and me even today. Now, there are lots of different passages in the Bible that we can turn to when we think about Adam and we want to reflect on his story, but I want to focus on this one, Genesis 3, 1 to 7, because I think this goes right to the heart of what the story of Adam is about. Chapter 3 follows 1 and 2, so we've got to know something of 1 and 2. And here's how someone once described it to me. I think this is brilliant. Genesis 1 is a video, is like a video of the creation story. It tells the whole thing. But Genesis 2 is a photograph. It's a snapshot of a particular scene. And it's that scene that sets the scene for Genesis chapter 3. So what happens in Genesis chapter 2? Here's what happens. After God creates the heavens and the earth, he makes one man in his image to be holy as he is holy. And just before he makes the woman, Eve, he puts him in a garden. What does he say to him? He tells him, that he can eat of all the trees in the garden except one. And if he eats of that one tree, death will enter the world. And what's happening there in Genesis chapter 2, and the Apostle Paul fleshes this out in Romans chapter 5, what's happening is that as Adam obeys God and obeys his word, life, everlasting life and blessing, everlasting blessing, will come to the world. And so right back at the very beginning of the Bible, Genesis chapter 2, God comes to one man, and through his obedience, including at the tree, everybody born after him will live and be blessed forevermore. Now this morning as we meet as a church, we meet in Northern Ireland in the West. And we have said before that one of the features of Western culture is individualism. In other words, we tend to think of ourselves in isolation, in separation from people around us. So we tend to think, well, what I do doesn't really affect people beside me. And what other people do doesn't really tend to affect me. The Bible absolutely recognizes the uniqueness of every single person. 
everybody is uniquely made in the image of God. But at the same time, the Bible speaks of people corporately. There is one human race, not many, there is one. And as God comes to Adam, he is speaking to him as a corporate figure. That means that it's through Adam the whole world is affected. And that's why it's through his obedience to God, including at the tree, that life and blessing can be one for the world. That is extremely important to understanding the Bible and understanding what it teaches. And it's against that background that we come to Genesis chapter 3. And I want you to notice the very first line. Look at how it begins. Now the serpent, we're immediately introduced to a serpent. John in his gospel tells us this is the devil, the evil one appearing in and through a serpent. And notice how he's described. He was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God has made. Crafty. What does that mean? Well, let's explain them what comes next. Because in the same verse, what does he do? He speaks. Do you know any animals that speak? Have you ever heard an animal speak? No, animals don't speak. Parrots don't even speak. Parrots just make noises. Animals don't speak. Humans speak, which illustrates what the serpent has come to do. He has come to corrupt, or you could say pervert, what God has designed in the world. That's why, did you notice who he speaks to? He speaks to Eve. Why doesn't he speak to Adam? It was to Adam that God gave his word. It's through Adam's obedience that life and blessing will come to the world, but the serpent speaks to Eve. Why? Because he comes to corrupt, pervert what God has designed for the world. I want you to notice how he does it. I want you to remember this the rest of your life. He says, did God really say? In other words, he attacks God's word. When you're a child, you learn what people do, who people are and what they do. You learn that teachers help us learn. You learn that police officers uphold the law. Firefighters put out fire. Business people make deals. Ministers Nobody really knows what they do. <laughs> These are people and what they do. And straight away in Genesis chapter 3, as soon as we're introduced to the serpent, we're told exactly what he's come to do. He comes to corrupt what God has designed, pervert what God has designed for the world, and he does it by attacking his word. We live in a world that constantly attacks God's word. Where does that come from? This is where it comes from. It comes from the evil one. I want you to see how he does it. He says in verse 1, Did God really say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? Now hold on a minute. That's not what God said in Genesis chapter 2. God told Adam, you can eat of every tree except one. He says, did God say you can't eat of any tree? In other words, the way the serpent comes to corrupt what God has designed, the way he attacks God's word is by misrepresenting it. And as he does, he seeks to undermine its goodness and make it appear as if it's overly oppressive. It's clever. Before he then turns in verse 4 and he says, you'll not die if you eat off the tree. In other words, what God has said is false. 
Don't believe it. Before he then turns and says, ignore it. For God knows that when you eat, you will be like God. In other words, don't believe what God has said. Throw it out. Decide yourself. As if you can choose what's right and wrong. As if you're God. Live whatever way you please. And right here in Genesis chapter 3, as the serpent speaks to Eve with her husband by her side, the whole of world history and the prize of everlasting blessing and life now rests on the response of one man. Will he respond in obedience to God and God's word, including here at the tree? Or will he give in to the ploy? Undermine the goodness of God's word. Make it out to be oppressive and restrictive and then ignore it as if it's false in order that he can live as if he's God. What's he going to do? I remember when I was really young, my mom took me to Crazy Prices. Remember Crazy Prices? Had the best adverts ever. But I remember my mom took me to Crazy Prices. I remember walking into the supermarket and looking around and seeing bubble gum. And I knew I wasn't allowed bubble gum. It was right before dinner. My mom said, you can't have that. It'll put you off your tea. But I wanted it. I remember learning in church the Ten Commandments, and I remember learning that God calls us not to steal. But as I walked about crazy prices, I saw the hubba bubba. And I felt the pull. I remember as I walked through the supermarket, trailing behind my mom, I remember seeing the hubba bubba and thinking to myself, I know I shouldn't take it. I know I shouldn't want it. I know God says not to take it, but I want it. I remember thinking to myself, and I've had a really hard day at nursery school. I only got two minutes in the sand pit and never even get into the water pit. As I looked at it, I remember thinking, I've been in this supermarket for 15 minutes. Do you realize how long that is? And I want it. God doesn't want me to be miserable, does he? Surely it's not a big deal. You ever experienced something like that in your life? Ever felt the pull? Every single temptation in life to do what's wrong, every one, is an attack on God's word. Along with it comes the invitation to play down the goodness of what God has said, to make it out to be oppressive, and then reject it as if you can be God yourself. Every single one. We see it when it comes to the Bible, do we not? What's the temptation that comes with how we view the Bible? Did God really say that this is his word? Did God really say that this is holy? That it's without error? That you can trust it? And this is applicable right into your life today? Did God really say that? What's the invitation that comes with it? Play down its goodness. But sure, it's hard to understand. Lots of people have lots of interpretations. And then make God out to be overly oppressive. But if you have to read it, that seems like hard work. I've got to listen to sermons. I've got to try and work it out. What happens if I get a different opinion to somebody else? Did God really say this is his word? You see it when it comes to what the Bible says about you and me. That every single one of us is fallen and in need of salvation. What's the temptation? 
Did God really say that everyone's a sinner? And with it's the invitation to play down his goodness. Sure, that's offensive. People don't want to hear that. Make them out to be oppressive. That's not a message of hope. You see, when it comes to the character of God, when the Bible says that God is good and he is always good, that God is loving and he is always loving, what's the temptation? Did God really say that? Why does he let bad things happen in your life then? Is that not the temptation that comes with it? If God lets bad things happen in your life, he's not loving. He's not good. Did God really say? You see it when it comes to how we ought to live as Christians because when Jesus Christ transforms your life, every single part of your life comes under the lordship of Christ. Such that when it comes to how we ought to respond to people who irritate us, how we spend our time, the lifestyles that we pursue, the websites we visit when no one's watching, the TV programs that we fill our times with, everything comes under the authority of Christ and his word. What's the temptation? Did God really say you need to look to him and everything? That seems exhausting. That's hardly good. You see, when it comes to how we ought to live within the family, within the home, when it comes to how husbands are called to treat their wives, when it comes to how wives are called to treat their husbands, when it comes to how parents treat children and children treat parents, what's the temptation? Did God really speak about these things? Sure, that's outdated. We have moved on. That's hardly fair. You see it when it comes to church. Did God really tell us that there's a way to have church? That the church ought to function in a particular way? That there's a particular cause that must be championed, that is to be championed in church? That is to be led and upheld in a certain way? Did God really speak about those things? Did he really say that he calls me to attend services and to serve? And Did God really speak about that? Does he not realize I'm tired? Does he not realize that I'd be far better served if I just lay in the Sunday and put my feet up? Does he not realize that I don't necessarily want to serve along those people? Did he really say? And so on and on it goes. Every single scenario we find ourselves in, every temptation to do wrong goes back to Genesis chapter 3. Did God really say? You ever experienced that in your life? How does Adam respond? Notice at the end of verse 6, three stunning words. That following Eve, he and he ate. And he ate. And as soon as Adam takes of the fruit of the tree, immediately death enters the world. Spiritual death. As he ruins his relationship with God unto physical death where he will eventually succumb to the grave. And as he sins against God, so everybody born after him likewise is born into a state not of blessing and life, but of sin unto death. That's why we die. And that's why you and I sin. And that's why you and I so easily give in to temptation and why looking at a packet of hubba bubba bubble gum, we so easily give in. Which means at the very end of Genesis chapter 3, you cannot help but wonder well, hold on a minute. If everlasting life and blessing was to come through the obedience of one man, including at the tree, 
could there be another Adam to come? If God designed that life and blessing would come to the world through one man in his obedience, could there be another one to come? A second Adam. Someone who being fully man would be yet without sin. Someone who in the face of temptation would respond in faithfulness to God and God's word so that through that man, Life and blessing might come to all. Could there be another Adam to come? Well, in Genesis 3.15, God promises to send one who will crush the head of the serpent. And every time you turn the page in your Bibles, every single time the Bible is anticipating, who is this serpent crusher to come? until you get to the Gospels. And as soon as you get to the Gospels, you're introduced to one who being fully God would be yet fully man, fully man yet without sin. His name, of course, is Jesus Christ. Do you know what Paul calls him in Romans 5? He calls him the last Adam. Why is he calling that? Well, if you go back to Luke chapter 3 and 4, if you read them this afternoon, you'll see that this is what happens. Right at the start of Jesus' ministry, just before he begins his ministry, Jesus is baptized, and God declares, you are my son. What happens next? Immediately after his baptism, Jesus is taken not to a garden, but to a wilderness. And the wilderness in the Bible is a place of testing. And as Jesus goes into the wilderness for 40 days, the serpent comes. What does the serpent say to him? Three times he says, if you are the son. In other words, did God really say that you're his son? And behind his question is an attack to play down the goodness of God and make him out to be oppressive. In other words, did God really say you're his son? Well, if he did, why did he lead you into a place of testing? That's not good. That's not good for you. What God said's wrong. He didn't say, leave this, Jesus. Go and enjoy yourself elsewhere. Did God really say? And yet as Jesus faces the temptation of did God really say, three times he responds, it is written. God did say. And as Jesus responds to the temptation by truly and fully trusting in God and God's word, obediently responding to him, he then begins the rest of his ministry. And yet, having gone through the whole of his ministry, remaining faithful again to God and to his word, we find him tempted by the serpent once again, where three times the serpent comes through people and says, if you are, did God really say? When do we find that? We find it at the very end of his ministry, when Jesus is on the cross, when Jesus is at the tree. And on the tree, as Jesus faces the temptation, did God really say, just as he did at the beginning of his life, so he responds in complete and absolute obedience to God and God's word. That unlike the first Adam who gave in to the temptation to undermine it, misrepresent it, and ignore it, Jesus Christ remained faithful to it in complete and utter obedience to God and what God has said. So that through his life, he would live the life that you and I ought to have lived. And he would die the death that we deserve. So that on the cross he would crush the head of the serpent. 
and rise again from the dead so as to take people like you and me. So that all who were born after Jesus, not naturally, but reborn by the Spirit of God, as we come to him and he cleanses us and renews us and reforms us, so for his people he might win everlasting life and blessing for all. See, the story of Adam is not so much the story of a man, a woman in a garden at a tree with an apple and a snake. The story of Adam is the story of everlasting life through the obedience of one man, the obedience of the Jesus man, through his life and his obedience at the tree. And as we get an insight into the life of Jesus, so the story of Adam is ultimately a story of the gospel. And this is the gospel. That all for Christ, all born through and in and after Jesus Christ, have everlasting life and blessing in him. As we hear this story this morning, This is not just a story for the sake of information. This is a story of real history, but it's also a story for us to come to and respond to this morning too. Because if the life of Jesus Christ is one who overcomes sin and temptation, then for all united to Jesus, that's what the Bible, how the Bible describes Christians. We are spiritually united, spiritually joined to him. For all who are united to Jesus, so his power is real in our lives too. So that as he overcomes temptation and remains faithful to the word of God, so as to live and bring blessing to the world, so his power is in us as well. That in him and through him, you and I may resist temptation, hold on to his word, and experience life and blessing today and every day into eternity to come. I wonder this morning, what temptation are you facing in your life? What temptation do you face this morning? What temptation do you face to reject what God has said? Maybe it's something to do with the Bible and how you view the Bible. A lot of people wrestle with the Bible. Maybe you face a temptation to do with who you are before God. And the idea, the calling, the truth, that we've all fallen and we all need salvation in him. Maybe you don't like that. Maybe you're resisting it. You face the temptation to push it to one side. Maybe you're facing a temptation to do with the character of God. That even in the circumstances of your life, that he is still good that he still loves you and that you can trust him. You're facing that temptation to ignore him. Maybe it's something to do with how the gospel calls us to live holistic lives of holiness or something to do with the home. Maybe something in your marriage, something with your children. Maybe you're wondering whether you should walk away or something that you're advising your children to do. You're facing a temptation to push aside God's word. Maybe it's something to do with church, but whatever it may be this morning, wherever you face the temptation this morning, God wants you to know where it comes from. It's a satanic ploy, and it will lead you to death and destruction. Here's the good news of the gospel. Here's the good news of the Bible. The good news of the gospel is that as Jesus Christ crushes the head of the serpent, so he overcomes, so that all united to him might stand in his power by his might and faithfully live in obedience to him in the fullness of life and blessing forever. So this morning as you hear this message, 
May you come to Jesus Christ, whether you're a Christian or not, the same is true for all, to come to Christ this morning, the last Adam, and hold on to him, and cling to him, and embrace him, so that you may stay faithful and true to his word, and experience true life, and true blessing, without end. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you so much for your word. And we thank you for the Lord Jesus. That whereas Adam failed, the obedient man did come. We thank you for Christ's obedience. And we thank you for his death and his resurrection and that for all in him today, we might likewise stand upon the truths of your word and remain faithful to you in true life and true blessing. God, I pray this morning for those of us who are struggling, for those who maybe particularly face the temptation this morning to turn away from you, and for all of us who constantly face that temptation, at different times in our lives, lead us to the Lord Jesus. Keep us in him. And may you make us a people who stand firmly, confidently upon what you have said and all that you say in your word to the praise of your name. Lord God, I pray this morning that as we meet together, we would be mindful of those around us who are suffering. We pray for those who are sick this morning, here at home. We pray, Lord, that you would heal and restore. We pray for those this morning who are grieving. We pray that you would surround them with your love and care. We pray for those this morning who have heard bad news. Would you give them a hope and confidence in the word? We pray, Lord, for all that goes on in our church. We pray for this evening as we come back to meet again for evening worship. We pray for all the activities that go on this week in church. We pray, Lord, that we would be a church that embraces and proclaims and loves your word. Would you give us a greater hunger for it and a greater love for the Savior and a greater determination in him to live as you've called us to live. We pray, Lord, for our denomination more generally. We think of the committees and councils that it has. We pray that you'd raise up good people to serve on those. And we pray, Lord God, for our world. We pray the message of the last Adam would be proclaimed so as to bring you glory and you praise, knowing that that is good for us. Lord God, would you lead us this morning, we pray, and that as we go about the rest of our day, may we stand firmly in him, to his praise, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, let's stand and sing about the last Adam. Let's sing.
Remember, we're back this evening at half six to kind of relaunch our evening services, so we look forward to seeing you then. That line in that song, um, Christ the story, his the glory, is really the point, the purpose of this kind of morning series. We're going to look at how the Old Testament, the whole Bible, is about Christ, and to him belongs all glory. And so next week, we're going to look at the person of Noah and the story of Noah and how it ultimately teaches us the gospel story. But until then, hear these words from the end of the book of Hebrews. Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen.